So I'll just introduce Ryan again. He's uh, one of the he's part of the instructors team at BISIS. Uh He's also um, a free scholar as well. He attends a lot of Brisbane-based teams. Schools. Sorry, that's my kid. And so he's going to take us through his uh, research process of how he looks at sources and then adapts them for practical use. So I'm going to hand it over to Ryan and he's going to take us through tonight's presentation. Uh, so I should have shared the screen there. Can everyone see it? Or Good. It's all working? Yep. i try and move Zoom over. There we go. Back. Alrighty, so what I picked as a title was from the source. Um, Eddie had it as from the sources. I think that might work better because a lot of this is about comparing sources rather than looking at just one source. It's kind of like uh, additive or supplementary. Um, I picked the page master just because I liked the picture. Um, I also wanted this, the SNES cartridge for nostalgia. But moving on, it's not important. So this PowerPoint, uh, roughly 40 slides. Um, so, um, and I've got the chat up here, so I'm happy to hear people chatting or asking questions. Um, I do have to pace things though to get through all these. And, you know, a lot of them are nonsense. So, um, you should be able to skip through quite a few without much time. But um, the Spanish stuff is at the last half. So if you care about hearing the Spanish content, you probably don't want to chip into that time too much. All right. Um, so sources, you know, there's that kind of uh, argument in HEMA. Uh, <laughs> get good, right? Like uh, you see a lot of uh, tournament competitors boast that they don't need the sources. And you know, to an extent that's true because what we have is a game, but I think that's a little less interesting, maybe a little more shallow of a pursuit. And some of the best competitors also supplement their practice with sourcing because they'll find, you know, generally sound advice and, um, you know, new things to practice and try out. So, um, you know, just admitting that humor is a game, you know, uh, if your motive is just purely to practice and get good, then that's all you should do. It's like, um, it's like you're playing a video game, like an FPS or something, and there's two demographics who get really, really good at it, and it's not the people that do breakdowns and try and like psycho, or not psycho, like just analyze it to its core mechanics. It's just the people who play it over and over and over, like uh, like a 14-year-old kid or a professional gamer. Um, I don't know what that says about HEMA. I don't, we don't really tend to have a lot of kids. We don't tend to have a lot of professional fences. Um, but the people who do good at HEMA tend to really, really practice and put those hours in. Um, so that, this lecture is not really for those people. So uh, I've never actually played this game. I saw the movie. And for some reason in this game, a, a game based on a movie about reading, the books are enemies. I don't know why that's the case. Um, but I feel like that's a good metaphor in a way is that like you're kind of trying to defeat the book because a lot of these authors don't write them to be very digestible content <laughs> so yeah just i wanted to find another excuse to put the page master into this um so where i started um was a tradition um the german tradition Lichtenau. um i don't want to talk too much about it because i'd rather go into the sources but they basically start off um the book I have, I've got it here, Christian Tobler's uh, in St. George's name. I think I'm hoping that's towards the camera. And uh, okay, so he's, he's done some pictures, but the text itself is just text. So you kind of had to use your imagination to figure out how it should look like. No pictures, sad face. So but um, it's a good place to start because it shows where I started. And it also, there's about 50 plus German text translated to English now. So as a lineage, it's one where people are very confident in because they've had a lot of ability to cross compare these sources. So I starting at like Longsword 101, um, they had the Zornau Ort, which is, you know, the Raft cut point essentially, kind of like a raft cut thrust. Um, 
I picked up this picture from Wichtenauer. It's a later treatise uh, that copied the text and provided uh, new images. So my version did not have this. Um, and uh, just to say about the Lichtenauer tradition, it had two kind of formats merged together. Um, Lichtenauer supposedly passed down the Zettel, the epitome, like a poem. And then other authors would then uh, do their own commentary on it in a glossary. glossary. So um, that's the format that it was rendered typically. So we're just going to break that down with one example of how I've treated the Zornhau org. Um, just a comment on pictures. Um, I, I, I really just wanted to use this image, but, <laughs> but like, uh, so the pictures can be misleading. So like this, not a bad picture, but there is bad pictures as I'll give as an example in the next slide. Um, this is Lakishna, uh, essentially the list to now along so that if you could do it with one hand with a knife, you made the longest measure. So what we have here is his image for Eber, which means boar. Um, essentially a kind of like a side guard that's low, uh, I guess, you know, code along the strata, porta de ferro, that kind of thing. Uh, so on the left is the right-handed version. On the right is the left-handed version. I hope that's not flipped for the PowerPoint, but one of them to me looks very wonk. So if we look at that text there, then you should also perform the EBA from the left side with the mezzo and assume the guard this way. Hold your mezzo at your left side of the hip so the long edge is turned upwards and the hilt is a bit lowered towards the ground and the point stands upward against the face of the man as it depicted below. Um, I put seams legit below because I don't think it does. Um, cause look at, there is some images where Lakishna seems to have these figures looking away or twisting around, but I think this one is a clear case of the artist just <laughs> failing to understand what he was meant to be drawing. Cause it's like, uh, I don't know. Can you it's see the cursor? Hip, is it? This is what? It's nowhere near there. Hip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm more concerned that he's like looking up here and he's like twisted. He's like kind of got his body facing to the left away. It's like he's bent his whole structure around that. It's like, it, that, it should be that on the left side. And I don't know. Yeah, it's not the same thing at all. Yeah. I mean, so I feel like that's one of the worst. I mean, not the worst. It's like the thing I'm least concerned about is that it's a little bit further away from the hip. Um, cause that one is too, but <laughs> anyway, I just want to say that like, you shouldn't always just double down on pictures and copy them like verbatim because I think artistic license is a thing that artists can fly. Anyway, so here's yeah. the full text. I don't want you to dwell on that too much because I am going to break it down uh, into two different pieces. So using the, using the mouse, um, we have the Zettel here, which is just, you know, a poem. A lot of the times it rhymed in the German, I think most of the time. Uh, so we have whoever overhears you, rack you, point, threatens him. And Hugh Howe is like a direct translation, but it's probably not contextually the best, but that's a personal preference. Anyway. Um, I grabbed all this from uh, Wichtenauer because, you know, that's public. So moving on, I don't want to read out the gloss. So just looking at that line, does anyone have any ideas of how they would interpret that line by itself in isolation? <laughs> anyone? <laughs> so just <clears throat> linguistically, there's... If I were to break this down in English, when I, what I feel like it's saying is that, is that if somebody is going to overhew you, your job is to rescue point into their face so that they back the heck off. Yeah, um, I think that's a good way of reading it. Um, it's essentially the way I view it is like it's a counter thrust into a cut, an overcut. Um, yeah. So moving on. Um, it is simple. I, I think we, I think we piece that together. Um, there's a lot of past experience involved as well. Um, but when it's a vague little sentence like that, it could mean a lot of things like, um, what height, what way are you moving? 
Um, sometimes it's not clear who's initiating, but in this case, obviously you're being attacked from above. But moving on, people can kind of make that into a lot of different things, which is why having that glossary is good as well, because it has a little bit of uh, context. Um, for example, like it says a simple peasant strike, which is, well, I guess I'm, I guess I'm guessing, but I feel like it's a person who's untrained. It's like, this is what their committed attack they're going to do if they haven't been taught how we fence. But um, it also has without any parrying. So that's another point I would focus on because it's giving details. And as well, if he is then soft on the sword or obviously that the implied is that if you do something else, if he is uh, fighting you, because soft is almost like conceding. Anyway, uh, so set on is another contextual thing. If you've read, if you've read the source, the German sources, there, um, set on is this kind of like thrusting of opposition, or kind of like binding. Um, it'd be a setzen, no, absetzen in this context. Anyway, so I think that peasant strike is a thing that would be good to look into. I know. Christian Pobler has done an article on how uh, German medieval language gives context in the sense that he tried to look at archetypes and like culture and, you know, get into the linguistic things. Um, so I think that brings an element that gets a bit neglected, but I don't have time to really go through that. So here's my, I guess, modern English rendering of that text before. And it's tried to keep the advice they had in the gloss. So if they cut at you from above, like an untrained person will, you attack into their attack. Don't reduce your reach by parrying it. And if they do not contest you with strength, thrust their head or torso. So I'm trying to work out why they would say, don't parry it. And I guess I don't want to smash anything in my room. So I'm using a short thing. This is what I had it in my room. But if you, can you see? Yep, I can see myself. So if you just attack, <laughs> um, how am I going to do this? Back here? Yeah. Uh, so if I'm just attacking, I get this good extension. But if I was to parry, I lose that extension. So I think this is a way of analyzing why they say something. Because they don't give the answer specifically or directly at least. And I think that's a thing that will come out in practice. Like you'd be like, Oh, I never have time to go. Dun, dun. It always has to end up being like <laughs> straight to the point. And I'm sorry that it's not on the screen. It's a very small camera. But um, yeah, don't want to do that to death because there's other things. So like I said before, there's like 50 plus treatises translated to English. Um, and there's different authors and different illustrations and they're all doing their own sort of take on it, but they're working from that same tradition. And I, I, I guess I, I feel like other traditions should envy that because that gives so much information that others don't. But please move this. Oh, well, Julian's joined. Okay. So, yeah. That's why I think I've got the habit of comparing sources. And I don't always think it's the best thing to do with other texts because they can be very, very different and not as um, consistent. But it's a habit that was built from from the very start for me that like the moment I started, I've got Ringek. I mean, you can't see what I'm pointing at. I've got Ringek, I've got Jürgen Meyer, I've got von Danzig, I've got Falkner. Um, it's a really cool, it's a really cool thing to have. But yeah, moving on. No, it's not. So what I wanted to do was compare. Hey, Ryan. Yep. Can, can, I don't know if you're seeing this, but at least on my screen, yeah, in the middle of the upper, like upper fifth of it, there's a little window with yellow outline with red text on yeah, black. Yeah, please says, move this window away. And now yeah. it's disappearing. It's so, going to come back. It's been pulsing. That's annoying. Um, Please move this window away. 
what window? Unwired application. What the heck, right? It's not. Oh, it is. Okay. That. Yeah. Okay. Easily fixed. It's just the droid cam thing. You know, first time I'm using it. <laughs> is it gone now? Yeah. So, you know, I started at Von Danzig and it doesn't have pictures. This guy is great for pictures and he's very unclear. So if I had started with this, I think I would have been really misled by the pictures compared to the text because he does not give nearly as much uh, detail as Von Danzig. So I think that's one of the arguments for a comparison is that suddenly I've got a text with clear images and I got a text with clear text and together better than the sum of their parts. So I'm just going to compare this with the previous thing and they're very similar, so it shouldn't take too long. Um, what we have here is their own. See, he doesn't really have the the kind of a uh, Zettel and Glosser thing going. He just kind of merged it together, almost like a uh, expansion of the original epitome. So do the right winding in the raft. If you wish to find the face open, he will defend his and take it away above without driving. Uh, hue, thrust, note soft or hard in the bind. So um, one of the first things there is it's lost that uh, that explicit statement that you against them over attack, right? But I will say in their defense, I don't know if I really want to look for the picture. Um, unless I find it straight away. Okay. So this image follows this one. Can you see? Basically, he introduces. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great quality, but um, he introduces the overhaul, the overcut. So it kind of working from that pre prior context. But anyway, um, if you wish, if you wish to find the face open, he will defend his. So it's kind of like you're fighting up high. Then take it away above without driving. Do for us note soft or hard. So he's still working a thrust in response to an overhaul. But he's sort of already started up within the images. So we're left to piece together that what's happened is they've cut into each other's attack. Attacks come to him, he's cut into it, and then he's gone up and thrust. And if they're soft, he would, you know, thrust of opposition. If they're hard, he would disengage, presumably. Um, we're extrapolating a lot there, so it really helps that it can be compared with every other author who's talked about the Zornaut, yeah, which is an alternate spelling to what was rendered before, too. Uh, how does it compare? Yeah, I kind of already covered all this. So I'd say that it doesn't really give us anything new, but it does uh, fill in the gaps a little bit, make us a little bit more confident. I guess pads things out. Um, I do feel like um, when you have such deviations between the images, then you don't have to get too worried about the aesthetics, right? Because it's like they didn't seem to care too much about how it looked, or at least not in the frames they show. So if we compare that to the previous image here, yeah, so he's a lot more extended. It's kind of vertical, um, they're further apart in general. Um, you could probably speculate on why that is, I guess, different periods of time, because it is like two centuries later, but not that important. So I think that a really easy example, because the two sources are alike, um, and they're all kind of in an orthodoxy. So this is a cut where I don't have my own surefire interpretation of, you know, uh, Chris Lee would recognize this because, you know, it's a suppressing cut from Maya. Um, you worked through that and did your own little summary. Um, do I want to read out that whole text? Not really. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if anyone feels like they're up to reading that, but... Essentially, it's like a cut you make that is followed by a thrust, or it can be followed by a cut, which is 
something to talk about, I guess. But kind of like you've started high, you've cut down, and then you go from a thrust from there. But there's a lot of ways you could interpret how that initial cut happens. Like <laughs> the camera's a bit not up to the task for this. Um, so I actually, I prepared a video, not, not me personally. I, um, I always check Rutherford's videos on these kind of things. So hopefully it will share the screen. Does this work? Um, anyone? No? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so where's the, uh, maybe Eddie can help, where's the share function on this? <laughs> um, so you just, what you probably want to do is um, close or just minimize the PowerPoint window. And then we should see a desktop. I think he's actually got the the PowerPoint app itself as it went up. <laughs> yeah, it's just the PowerPoint was over the uh, Zoom functions. Anyway, this is uh, Rutherford's interpretation of it. So any questions? Um, any comments? Can you play it again? Go. Pretty much it. Cool. So I don't know if anyone noticed, but um, you already start with, they always start way out of distance. That's something he's commented on. So I, I'm happy to disregard that. It seems to bother some people that he does it that way. His argument is that he starts out of distance so you can see the technique a lot easier. And maybe there's a point to that. Um, but if that was something that was bothering people, yeah, it's, it's intentional. So what we've got here, I don't want the sound playing, is that he's gone up for a cut, up to the high guard, or I believe the text says, and he's cut down on their weapon. Text says on their forte or their arm, but they're a bit out of distance, so it's a bit more towards the middle. So that's a little different. But um, And then he just extends his arm and thrusts. And I'm pretty okay with that. I don't know if anyone has a different idea of what it should be. Is he meant to be looking at the ground or is that? Just... <laughs> no, it doesn't say anything about where you look. Okay, good. <laughs> it's definitely a habit I have though of looking at the ground. Back to the PowerPoint. That actually sounds because if you're that inclined, <clears throat> if your body is that angled, keeping your head up and looking at your opponent is hard enough without a mask, but to try to do it with the mask and a lack of head protection would be very, very difficult. Um, so, sorry, you're saying it would be hard to look up? Yeah, if we're talking about, in the video, the fencer on the left, when he finishes his strike, you know, he, he's ended and then he's struck, and you say that he's looking down at the ground, the reason I think he's doing that is because that keeps a straight spine from from skull to neck to back. If you were in that position, ending with that much of an incline of your body, to keep your head up looking at your opponent where you're 
you know, your face is parallel to their face uh, could be could be uh, unpleasant. It could be uncomfortable. It could cause strain. It's bad enough without a mask on, but you put on all your equipment and you're actually fighting your equipment to keep your head looking up. Uh, I, I, would, I would suggest that it's an exaggeration just to show the audience what's going on. Yeah, and it could be that, well, if you look at um, Maya's images, they're quite big on the posture. Um, let's see how close I can get that. Um, fix this page. I picked image G because while that's not describing the action, that's kind of the closest thing in the illustrations he has to it, um, where he's just sort of come down above and thrust from there. Um, but you can see that uh, Yoko Meyer even talks about it a little bit, that he's, um, he recommends kind of large movements. And I think that's like an exercise device. But anyway. Uh, my thing about the head was an aside. It's not a part of <laughs> figuring out whether an interpretation tells you to do it or not. It was an aside. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess you guys, when you go to WMAW next time, you have to ask him, why do you look at the ground? <laughs> I, I thought I would have thought the posture, like keeping the head up, would be pretty good. At least I feel like that gets a good extension of the torso, but each to their own. So, um, so what I have here is he wrote two books, right? So if you don't like how he described it one way, there's a second way you can look at it. Um, I don't need the book. <laughs> And so he, first off, he has a Dusak section and a rapier section. He actually mentions this in the Dusak section of that book. I don't know if he mentions it in the other one, but in the Dusak section, he, had, he just says cuts. He doesn't say any thrusts. And, you know, he has a different idea of what Dusak's meant to be compared to his rapier section. But uh, we have a much shorter description here. So 78B suppressing. Note, when an opponent thrusts at your left, lift so that as he gathers his thrust, the point extends upward, and then step with your left foot behind your right and cut strongly in a slicing action from above on the forte of his blade. Instantly thrust forth up at his face. And he has a version for the right arm as well. So it's not that different. It has like, an, it mentions the forte of his blade. It doesn't mention cutting to his arm. It mentions a thrust, it doesn't mention thrust and cut, which is what the other uh, 1570 text does. So it's a very abridged version, I guess, even though it came earlier. So a lot of people prefer this version of Maya because of that reason, that all these texts are a lot more succinct and brief. And the reason I wanted to put this up is because if you don't like how it's described, it's sometimes helpful to look at how it's described in another work because this is so much easier to read than the previous text. And it says essentially the same thing. All the core details are there. Um, so I just summarized that pretty much just then. But, um, so you've already kind of seen a bit of my method there where I look for alternate writings and I check videos, which is good for German, not so good for Spanish because there's not that many videos with the Spanish fencing tradition. Um, so multiple traditions and form. And a lot of that is what can I get away with when I fence? Because there's a lot of elaborate motions and ways to read things that will just simply not work once you try to put it into practice. Because practice will, as the example I did before, it will start to make motions shorter. Instead of bang, bang, you get more direct actions that take less time and that you can get a good structure behind. Um, there's other kinds of blade actions we see in different things if you've trained in a different school. I mean, there's a Yotaho and a Stringeri, which both make contact on the blade. You know, there's different parameters and details to them, but you kind of refer back to your past experience when interpreting a new one. Um, the other one is frog DNA, but that doesn't really help that much here. I don't think the action is, has too many parallels. But uh, Meyer himself said he learned from foreign people. So you'll see uh, Conti wrote an article on Hura that is pretty much like, they called it Maya Rosso to try and link the two together. And I think they make a pretty good argument for that. That's who I would certainly link Maya to when he's referring to his, what he's learned in foreign 
lands and whatnot. Uh, Rutherford's book, he has a whole section linking it, comparing it to Vigiani. Um, I don't know if that's that helpful, but you can see parallels. I mean, well, you can see parallels between Morozov and Vigiani as well while we're at it. Um, I'm looking at some videos lately, especially the ones from WMAW, where they, a bunch of them are starting to uh, comment on its resemblance to Spanish fencing. Um, I don't really want to make an argument for that. It's not mine. Um, I can kind of see it. Uh, let them do it, I guess. So the way I look at it is like I try to, I have direct links almost to Lishtenauer and Lakushna because he actually uses the same guards and a lot of devices from those texts. So I'm more likely to emphasize things that are explicit um, and I would look at Morozzo because it does seem superficially at least to resemble Morozzo and he was very, you know, popular in Italy at the time. Um, so just a little comment because a lot of that is talking about how you interpret sources in relation to other sources and, you know, different traditions. So there's a criticism about frog DNA that you shouldn't, and that there's, it's legit because it can mislead. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of things you'll see lately well, you've always seen them. There's only so many ways to use a sword. Um, there's only so many actions. Um, everyone's trying to be better at it, so it kind of selects for certain maneuvers. And I, I say Bane all that true, because it is. It's a little bit boring. It's like saying, you know, there's no real novelty. Everything kind of boils down to the essence or foundation, but it's hard to refute. But um, dinosaurs can be cool too, so I can see why you want to fill in the gaps and you know this is this more flippant comments because I really just wanted to rant about DNA but they have a 521 year half-life so you know every 500 and more bit years the DNA halves um, they're not getting dinosaur DNA at this point and him is a little bit like that because the books are so old um, we're very divorced from that past and we lose a lot of information from that past but anyway um, yeah, I, this is like my most flippant. I kind of made this slide and then tried to make an argument around it so it didn't quite get there. But, you know, I think feathers are cool, but it looks literally like birds and dinosaurs we have now, you know. Um, but dinosaurs are also cool because the Jurassic Park design is iconic. They're never going to top that one. <laughs> and this is a little game. It wasn't a great game, but it had a cool design where it mixed the feathers together and like they just blended in and it was a really cool mix. Um, if you, if fencing gets that way when you're trying to compare sources and it gets into like this cool hypothetical midpoint, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so I kind of already said all this, but um, there's an example recently we had with the Shaska. Shaska is like this if it was a saber it has a simple hilt and has a curve, single edged. And people are like, uh, well, Sa Eastern Saber is so novel, it has to be something really cool and exotic. And they bail up all these theories about, you know, it's the same with like the deal with the Polish cross cutting and things where it's like um, they let their imagination run wild with what it could be. And then we got this book here. Um, this is one of the two translations I know and what they're adapting is the Shaska for military saber and it's like in, it's like a inside and outside guard it's conventional their arms a little bit retracted but it's not what it was built up to until <laughs> so I guess temper your expectations of what it is because once you get the actual sources translated and released and published, it might, it's got, might be a lot more mundane. But, you know, if you can think up really cool dinosaurs. <laughs> I like dinosaurs, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, um, if, you do let you, if you do interpret old things, I guess, have a little, keep that ambiguity. Never, never stop looking and supplementing because if you think you've figured it out, probably haven't. <laughs> but you've already seen that I do kind of advocate it in some cases. So one of the things that we had with uh, Godinho when it was released very recently 
is that everyone was like, is it Bolognese? Um, is it Agrippa? Obviously, uh, Chris Lee and Tim Rivera both released their theories that it was very linked to St. Didier. Um, and I think that's all lovely. Um, I don't have the real patience for it, but um, if everyone can make their own theories, why can't we, I guess? Because it's a fun tool of exploration, especially when if you, anyone here who's read Godinho, which I'm willing to bet is most of you, he's not that clear on the details. It's more like bang, bang, bang. This happens, this happens. If they do this, do this. There's not a lot of context. There's not a lot of descriptions. A lot of times he doesn't mention the feet. Um, he describes like everything is fingernails up or fingernails down. But it's like, where? Um, so that's when you really want to start looking elsewhere. So I already put this on Pacheco. I don't think it got a lot of love, but I'm <laughs> going to put it here again. <laughs> uh, I've got these two texts. So established in whatever posture that he will, one of the two lowers his sword, retreating the body back, leaving the right foot in place where it was when he lowered and retreated only with the left, loading on it. If the opponent departs with the nails up thrust to the eyes or chest, as soon as he departs, incline yourself to your left side, not putting the eyes on the ground, but on the opponent's sword and thrust nails down to the belly. You will pass to the other side of the opponent. And now we have this kind of a similar thing. Um, Contra tempo, yeah, that gives it away that this is an Italian one. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably should have just left the names in, it's pretty obvious. Um, but they're both lying in narrow stance, and when Mili lifts his sword in the seconda, which is kind of like nails down here, and bowing his head and body towards the left side, uh, we have inclining towards the left. I've lost the place it was in. Should I mean with the left? Incline yourself to your left side, yep. Um, it has a little comment about the hand and, you know, uh, both cases, they would go to the outside over the right arm. You will pass on the other side of the opponent. So I draw immediate parallels there. So, you know, an excuse to use the office, but here's the comparison. And yeah, this picture, this is a gripper from the armor site. They have added in this image because that's kind of what's, um, that's kind of what's described in the text so they can demonstrate it going past them. So I noticed the similarities and the dissimilar, <laughs> the dissimilar. So counter the thrust by voiding under their sword, incline towards left side, nails down thrust to at least second, illustration looks a little palm out. Uh, you know, if you raise your hand a second, even though a gripper doesn't have hand positions, you kind of get your hand moving involuntarily. So that's what they've kind of done. They're like gone from, uh, once the guards third up to second and their hands kind of move with it. But um, anyway, so the thrust goes towards the outside, both opponents move, both, both move to the opponent's right side, so he's going that way. Um, the dissimilar, which none of it really contradicts, but it's like uh, extra. So describes an incline backwards onto the rear leg, which could very well be what a gripper did. If he's trying to move into the narrow stance, I could see that this is another way of getting into that narrow stance with the backwards incline, whatever. <laughs> he says to keep the left hand near. Um, Godinho doesn't talk about the left hand a whole lot. Obviously he has the mana plata, the slap, but who knows? It, that's one of the things that he never gives details on. But um, bowing to your head or body to your left side. So that doesn't. So like uh, Gudino said, incline to your left side. And this is bowing your head and body to your left side. So they're related, but they could be read very differently. Um, best case scenario, we have a picture. So if we didn't have that before. Now we have a picture that of what it might be, because uh, Gudino wasn't going to give us one when he was alive. Um, um, if people want to argue, I prepared the next slide. Um, I don't know if I'm willing to die on that, that pill, but <laughs> if you guys want to argue, we can have this argument. <laughs> um, did Gudinio not say to thrust to the outside at hip height? What was the hip height? He said you thrust to the belly. To the belly, yeah. Well, Gripper doesn't say where you thrust to. From what I can see. Hmm. 
Yeah, he doesn't give you a target. Yep. Okay. Just a difference and different to the pitcher. I expected the pitcher to be much lower and moving further out. Yeah, well, we don't know if this right one is to scale with this one because that's just something the armor has done. But So we could easily be getting lower than it's meant to because uh, I've got the book here. Where is it? It's not a very showy cover. Let's see if I can find a picture without getting lost. Alrighty, here we are. Uh, see, he's just targeting a ball. Maybe the ball is meant to be his target. I don't know. His sword's way higher than that ball. <laughs> yeah. But that's the pre-armor version. Um, yeah. Which that would, I guess, would imply that if he has to thrust the belly, and when this is to scale, then Godinho would actually be advocating a lower thrust than. A gripper, maybe. But anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. So I said earlier, some books are easier than others. We already had an example of Maya writing a second book that was a lot easier. Like, the first one was easy. The second one, a lot too detailed. So it's like, um, I, I keep emphasizing comparison. I'm like, you find a hard explanation, find an easy one. So here's just a comparison of why some books are very simple and what they did to make it simple and easy to read. So I always cite uh, Gian Daniel Leandre. I, I can't pronounce French words, so I'm inclined to call him Johan Langer or something. But um, And it might be a little much to read, but it has a very clear picture. Uh, and you've won the measure, your weakened quarter, yeah, yeah. located at the edge of the top side. Tempo. The point must be aimed at the enemy's body. The thrust must be performed with the extension of your arm, setting forth with your right foot. Uh, with that lunging, both moving the father, the point of your sword, both shoulders. He's giving a lot of detail, maybe more than he needed to, but it's certainly, you can't accuse him of being unclear. He's saying where you move the leg. He's saying you extend the arm. He's saying the stage as it happens in. It's saying when the context arrives. Uh, complete package, I'd say. <laughs> Does anyone disagree that that's a bad way of explaining a technique? <laughs> so, yeah. And then it cannot hurt if you use a left hand to help. Great. Like adding in things you could do. And then this. So, I don't want to pronounce Spanish words when Lois is here, but <laughs> culturenismo, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and the two uh, most iconic Spanish people that I can think of, uh, Miguel and Tulio, um, may not be historically accurate. I, I was thinking of like Cyclops optic blast. I, I hope people got that or it could just be heat beams. <laughs> it's the best that I was willing to do on MS Paint. <laughs> it, it would be really, really hard to render salt columns, I guess. Right? <laughs> yeah. So what I've got now in the next slide is I've got a little tiny piece of uh, Pacheco's six page explanation of a technique. <laughs> we got the Garatusa in his Volga Trina. Um, like I said, it is six pages and there's a lot of words on those pages. They're not small. It's not like a big text. <laughs> so, um, and do I, I guess I, I guess I have to read this. In the formation of this technique, there are 10 movements and a circle is made as large as the interval of the arm the sword is. The first is natural in order to be unequal to the right angle from where, as we have said other times, it is proposed that the contenders are established and the beginning is given to them. The second is offline lateral to the left side with which it is placed inferior and transverse to the opposing sword. The third and fourth are mixed violent aligning lateral until being joined to it. The fifth is offline lateral to the right side with which the deflection is done. The sixth and the seventh are natural and offline lateral with which they impel it to the left side and the circle is finished closing. That we say is done with the whole arm, the eighth and ninth are aligning lateral and violent in order to place the sword in a way. The last is forward in order to execute the thrust, leaving the opponent's sword free in those last three. Um, technically correct, but annoying. Um, does that work for anyone? Does anyone prefer how that's written? Does anyone like that? <laughs> 
Nope. I guarantee you the Spanish was worse. And to the best of my ability, what he is describing here is your sword's out like this, uh, aim towards the camera, and you just sort of like do that. <laughs> Why does it need to be that way? You, you'd be pleased to know he then says, all of these can be subject to free atajos. And then he does like a paragraph for each number. <laughs> it just goes on and on. I, this is why I'll never read Pacheco. <laughs> so what do I do there? Well, I've already said I'm not going to read that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll check out Puck Curtis's blog. I'll check out Blair's article. Um, the aphorisms and figurative that Lois translated, those are spectacular. Um, <laughs> you know, De La Vega condensing this translation into 19 rules. That's great. <laughs> I'll look for any source that's simple instead of reading the ones we got that are just incomprehensible to me without, I guess, racking my brain over it. <laughs> so I, I do want to jump in because I've got a question here and, and it is a bit of a selfish question. One of the things I've always wanted to do is with problematic sources like Pacheco, take those six pages and then condense it into plain English saying, you're making spiral action. He describes the spiral action with these particular terms, but like in very plain English, that's very far away from like a, a, a formal translation. But is that something that you, I'm, obviously you would probably prefer that, but do you think that there's a demand for it overall? I don't think I have a good measure of the community, but I think I can confidently say no, not many people read Pacheco. Um, not many people read long explanations. So it probably is, probably is what a lot of people would like because no one, no one is reading what we have. <laughs> so. Similarly, uh, Rada has got a very similar style. So like that Pacheco paragraph that's broken down to your basic movements and swords. And stuff. So he's set up a way of describing any fencing action, and it just means, you know, it's long-winded because it's got to be able to cover everything. And Rod has done the same thing with his cone with the, you know, 26 letters around it. So you're constantly talking about like move up to the, um, you know, aid on A or whatever. I think it's, it's like. To, to add on, it's like it's like a pendulum swing from the Vine Sewing and Godinho, where he doesn't bother to tell you what level his hand is and where the heck you should put your feet. Well, Pacheco and Rada will tell you very, very specifically where to put everything. Uh, yeah, I've heard that said about Tibo that um, you, you can accuse him of being overly complicated, but you can't accuse him of being um, unprecise or inexact because he gives so much detail that it, you can get a confident idea of what he's saying. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just don't have the, I don't have the temperament for it. Yeah, so to get back to Lois's question, I think there's definitely a place for both because a lot of people don't even want to, you know, start understanding the basic Pacheco's talking blocks. So the integral movements of the blade so that they could read that and have some idea what the hell he's talking about. So, yeah, I, I think that would be a thing that people would want. Yeah. So read Pacheco for me. <laughs> Which is basically what he's saying, right? You read that. Yeah. Write, write a, oh yeah, do a slight spiral. Yeah. Please. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't have good... The way I read it, it was more like it was a disengage and thrust. Was that not what he meant? Um, well, we can look at, um, what have I got here? So, I guess the confusion it creates is the problem anyway. Continue. I skipped ahead a few times, but um, I'll go back to where we were, but this was going to be later. Um, this is one thing I look at. It's a common Iberian glossary all the time. Uh, as far as I can tell, the Garatusa is not described the same way twice. <laughs> <laughs> so you can so, so really what I'm using them for me is um looking at how Godinho described it. So if we go back to the da 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 da, da part. Um Garatusa is when two are established nails up, one of them in the same posture gains the opponent's sword from above, bang. 
uh, well along a length, goes twisting the hand in the manner the sword gives a turn around the opponent. Um, so very, just very quickly to, to, to sort of help you along here. I, I know that that uh, glossary says that Garatusa is translated as a scrawl. Garatusa can also mean a caress. Like in this action, if you're the one attacking, your sword caresses over the other before it goes in and slams the guy in the belly. Just something to, to think Makes about. Makes sense. Yeah, I don't understand Spanish. <laughs> yeah, so this was my comparison of like that one I, that explanation I hated compared with one that I quite like because, um, well, it's not detailed, but it's hard to get the wrong idea and so much easier to read. So my advice is, if it's too hard to understand, find a better author. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, this is the research involved. I, I guess, disclaimer, I do have, you know, a Bachelor of Arts <laughs> in history and ancient history, where, you know, you'd have to look at primary sources, secondary sources, and you'd have to accept that you're never going to get to the bottom of things, but you would try to compare as much evidence as possible. And this is, I guess, the never-ending task of HEMA is um, new texts are being translated and discovered all the time. So that's really lovely, but um, we're never gonna, we're never gonna have like a view of what things were like at the time. So that's why I just think just doing the research, trying to find as many <laughs> bits of information as you can and then you know, smash them together. Um, one thing that Chris said to me a while ago was that like I would get to books and I would try to read them through start to finish. I didn't want to move on until I thought I had it. And then I'd just end up getting stuck or I'd like put it down and I'd just never pick it up again. Chris's advice was you yeah, do a light read through and then followed with a more detailed read through. So like, I remember Chris saying that he read through Tibo three times and he's like, oh, but the first two were like light. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's more than I ever got through Tibo because I read up till his chalk circles and I put it down <laughs> his purport his magical 10 numbers and how the human proportions all work out these numbers I'm like no. <laughs> and that's bad it's a, you cover a lot more ground if you just try to skim it and then you keep going back to get that more detailed look through afterwards because then you I guess you have more context and you can kind of start applying what you've read ahead back to it um, so just to explain, when I did, I did a summary of Godinho that you can find in various places. Um, and what I did was, I, it's not like I went through Godinho. It's not like I went chapter one summary, chapter two summary, chapter three summary. Um, first, uh, Tim was nice enough in his translation to have the vulgar treaters, uh, this is not going to work on the camera too well. Um, doesn't matter. Um, he also has his, uh, he has like a glossary and yeah, that's probably too blurry. But So what I essentially did was like this, I went to the common Iberian dictionary and I looked up all those terms and then I tried to look up to see the ones that find elsewhere, which is not a lot, to be honest. But it let me prepare myself for making mistakes in the reading of it, because then I could look at how Pacheco described it and, um, well, how Tim described it. And like I said, I believe it's different every time. Um, if I just go to the website again, hopefully I can share the screen without all that pain as before. Let me share. No. Yeah. Did I kill it? Is it there? Yeah, I can see people. Hi, Tom. Hi, Julian. Oh, it's where the browser tab is. So another thing you could always look at, is like I just had Garatusa there as an example, but it could be um, Zembalita, for example. Um, cause that's a very, cause then it will be like, 
uh, he related, he relates them to Balanzado and Defendido. We have notes like this is how Gabino describes his defensive rather than the offensive ones we get in the Volga treaters and things like that. And because this is online PDF, you can click to these places between and see the associations. Um, so when I had the German example before where the sources themselves have made a glossary, I guess this is the closest thing we're gonna to get to a modern glossary because the Spanish didn't. Um, I think that's very invaluable. <laughs> so yeah, I looked up all the little, all of the devices I was gonna talk about. I looked them up here and then I tried to follow them up and find out other things. So that I guess I wasn't caught by surprise if someone said, but in this thing, in this thing, and it's described this way here. Um, yeah, I hope if nothing else, people watching this, I hope they can like take away that this source exists. <laughs> At least if they're doing come in a bit, you know, the vulgar style, but yeah, it's great. It doesn't even really have to be strictly vulgar. Let's see. So we have the, the um, breaking, I guess. Um, but, you know, he says like things like, well, this is something that Figueredo describes. And, you know, Figueredo is meant to be legit, right? He's not vulgar. And other times, you know, Pacheco's description of the Arab Tahoe. Taho, I don't know if that's in the vulgar treater section, but I just mean, this isn't entirely just for common vulgar. This has some um, Spanish terms that are more general as well. <laughs> so if you like the Streza, that's a good source. You know, you know, if all you've seen is like Puck Curtis's blog, here's another thing. Um, so back to the PowerPoint, which is almost over the time, 8.30. Good. So um, I should point out that Four Gangs translations had this like lovely glossary at the back. So maybe this is like the Spanish Four Gang glossary in hindsight. Um, this is a little disclaimer that like, you know, reading the sources isn't going to get you it too far by itself. It's always going to be practice and testing. It's going to, it's like, it's like using the sources as a way to form hypotheses and then like actually try and prove, argue them through action. Um, so forming interpretations, only the first step, all prior experience. You've been training in HEMA for like two years. That stuff has currency when you're looking at other things. It saves a lot of time when you can uh, relate it to something else. Um, and actions will be selected for by time and strength. I just mean you keep practicing your actions. Uh, well, Sean, how do you feel about the spins I do when we fence? I wish you'd stop practicing. <laughs> but uh, they don't seem to work because they require um, time if, if nothing else <laughs> or a whole bunch more distance anyway <laughs> yeah so impractical actions are selected against in practice and I, I think that's inspiring i feel like we can get to where we want to be a little bit further <laughs> if bad actions get weeded out <laughs> um maybe past people were dumb and they did not know what they were doing you know just as claim that they not inherently 100 percent guaranteed to be right especially when they are uh, contradicting other texts but they're also people who dedicated their lives to the practice and like had to put up or shut up at times in the past so i like to assume that they at least know fencing something about fencing um and uh so maybe if you're reading it wrong you're doing it wrong it's not don't just jump to the assumption that the source is wrong um What I think is good about competition inspiring is that you can practice against an uncooperative opponent because everything works against a committed attack or someone who's trying to make something happen. Um, but real good techniques will work when they don't want to let you. Um, they're not the same, things aren't the same in the past, but well, we can't help that, can we? We can't go fight on the street with sharp weapons like the past could, but we work with what we have. All right. So it's never ending, um, South Park joke. Um, no real end point. 
hopefully just profit at some point. That'd be really great. And I believe this is what profit looks like for sure, because that's how the movie ended. <laughs> and that's that's the presentation. <laughs> I hope you had fun. Cool. That was good, Ryan. <laughs> One of the things you're talking about with the light read through, I always struggle to like stop myself from getting too involved in it. Which yeah. is where the audio book is great because it gives me no choice. It just keeps reading. 